never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus Oh fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus Oh fear you'll never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus Everybody, good evening and welcome to Southview. It's wonderful to be here with you as we gather together to worship our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and uh, to spend time in his presence, we hope, and to hear from his word. And as we begin, would you please stand up and we'll read together the prayer on the screen. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, let's sing together. Joy, baby. 
to fool my dry soul. Do not be quiet. Do not be silent. My heart is calling out for you. And it would be enough to stand at your door.
My name is Andrew Fisher. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening and a special welcome to those joining us online. So glad that you've joined us and I want to give a shout out to uh, Nolan McGregor who's hiding in the back making all the magic happen for the video and uh, for those watching online or, and those here know that very soon we will also be streaming live to YouTube so you can watch live on Saturday nights. So yay. A uh, couple announcements to make you aware of. Next weekend is our Southview Social. So this is a time when we as a church family, after our weekend services, get together out in the Cardo with tables and food. Uh, but we need you to bring some food. And uh, so we want to remind you, next weekend, Southview Social, bring food. Uh, and the theme is this of this weekend is going to be Food You Love. That's open for a lot of interpretation, so looking forward to see what you bring next weekend. Great time to get to know one another, spend time with people you know, and hopefully meet some new people as well. Following that, on February 14th, is our Ash Wednesday services. So that's Wednesday, February 14th, 5.30 and 7.30 p.m. Now, you may be thinking, February 14th, that sounds like it might be important in some way. And guys, that is Valentine's Day, so don't forget. It is a special day, but what better way to start off a season in which we remember the greatest love story ever told, right? That for God so loved the world, he sent us his son. So as we prepare for Easter, we do so on Valentine's Day, but also Ash Wednesday, and uh, enter into that Lent season. So a great time for us to gather as a church family in a circle in here and uh, and to celebrate what the Lord is doing in us, through us, and with us. Our ministry story this week comes from our children's ministry. Do you know that last weekend there were over 270 kids in our children's ministry and over 50 volunteers working with them? That's pretty amazing. And the majority of us as adults started our journey with Jesus when between the ages of 4 and 14. So this ministry is incredibly important. Uh, their lives are being changed. While we're sitting in here, they're hearing stories, they're playing games, they're having fun, and they're learning the lessons about Jesus. And so, and, and all of that is run by our volunteers, and we're so happy that uh, there's so many children there. So remember them as we meet in here. They're out there learning as well. And in two weeks from now, grades one to six are going to be joining us in our main services for their worship together weekend. And this is an important part for their lives as well as ours, to join together as a family and worship together, part of their discipleship. The kids will get a bring it back bag if they stop at the uh, kids check-in center. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what's in there, but it'll help them to engage in the service for the weekend. And uh, it'll be a really cool thing. And maybe we'll even have one or two of them step forward and do our scripture reading like we seek our volunteers to do. We'll see. But that, that ministry and all our ministries are only possible because we have so many people who give. And our focus today is on giving liturgically, our liturgical giving focus. Uh, your generosity allows us to provide ministries like the children's ministry and help our young ones to learn to passionately follow Jesus. Giving's a very important part of our worship. And if you're part of Southview family, you probably know that. And we hope you remember that. Uh, we don't pass the plate around anymore, but it's still an important part of who we are and what we do. Our world is focused on stuff, isn't it? Uh, it seems to be the motto of he who dies with the most toys wins. But we know that's not what God calls us to. He calls us to be people of generosity and loving him. And his kingdom is one of love and generosity. So to give is an act of faith. It's giving out of our hearts. It's giving out of a trust in Jesus. And I'm thankful that many years ago that message hit home with me so that I've been able to give as part of my worship and see how many others are blessed, not just me. I get blessing too, but it's awesome to see how the Lord can take just a small gift and multiply it. Remember the uh, five loaves and two fish that fed a multitude of people? The Lord can do that with all of our giving. So we're thankful for that. So though, to those who give financially, uh, whether it's through the website, through Realm, through the boxes on the wall as you head out the doors. No matter how you do it, we want to say thank you. Uh, we couldn't do what happens in this building without you and beyond this building. There's so many ministries that reach out to our community as well, so thank you for doing that. But also understand that giving isn't just about money. 
there's many ways in which we can give. And we give of ourselves through our, our time, through our talents. You know, there's so many people serving all around us in this building today. And uh, we're so grateful for all who give in those ways as well. So let us, as a people of God, give generously of ourselves through our finances, through our time, through our efforts. And uh, we can celebrate his goodness to us in many ways. In a moment, we're going to go to prayer, and we're going to remember Foundation Baptist Church and the Holy Name Catholic Church. And then I'm going to ask one of you to step up, volunteer, and uh, read, uh, serve, give, uh, by reading our scripture passages for today. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you so much that you've called us here in this place for this time. And you know the words that we need to hear you know the touch that we need to have from you. And Holy Spirit, I thank you for the songs we've sung. We know that you're close. And Lord, we desire to surrender to you so that we can truly hear what you want to speak into our hearts and our minds. I thank you for the many children who are meeting in their classrooms even now. Pray for their, the volunteers who are leading those those classes, that they would have joy and that the joy of the Lord would be evident in that space and that these young ones would come to know you and those who do would be drawn deeper into your presence. Bless those ministries, we pray. Lord, I thank you for all who give and the many ways that we give. You are such a, a God of great blessing and able to multiply all that we do for your glory. And Lord, even through the act of giving cheerfully we find great joy because we can see how you are moving in so many ways. So Lord, use our gifts. Use even this time we give to you now to be a blessing and honor and sacrifice to you. And in just a moment as Pastor Devin comes to open the word before us, Lord, we pray that you would speak to his heart and his mind. And may our hearts and minds be open to what your spirit has to say to us here tonight. Lord, we do pray for Foundation Baptist and Holy Name Catholic Church. These two congregations are also meeting this weekend to seek your face. Lord, I pray that your truth would be evident in those spaces, that your word would be proclaimed, and that your name would be lifted up. So Lord, thank you for what you're going to do even with us here tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Who's going to step up and read all these pages on the, on the podium here? It's large font. I can read it from here, but I'm farsighted. So <laughs> somebody want to come on up? we got time. <laughs> come on up. Just ask you to introduce yourself and then read every page that's on there, please. So we have a gospel reading for today and the Devon's, you know, you can just, that's just down here. You know, just down here. Go ahead. Good. Hi there. My name's Jonathan Newfeld, and I moved here with my wife uh, to Calgary from BC six months ago. I'm delighted to have the privilege here to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Delighted to have the privilege here to read the gospel for everyone. So the gospel reading is John 7, verse 37 to 46, New International Version. This is the word of God, the gospel according to John. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow within them. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. 
Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. The unbelief of the Jewish leaders. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. And next to the sermon text, you okay? All right, and that's Ephesians 5, verse 18 to 21. Ephesians 5, 18 to 21. Okay. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And instructions for Christian households. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Thank you. Great to see all of your lovely faces, at least as much as I can through the lighting. But my name's Devin, and I serve in our student ministries here at Southview, and today we get to hop into a fun passage, as we've already heard. But we're in a series called Rooted, and we've been working through this series over the last number of weeks, and simply put, over this series, our goal is to look at how we can live rooted in Christ here on this earth. Now, that's a pretty important thing to learn as followers of Jesus. And uh, trust me when I say this, it's not always easy to do that. It's an ongoing tension that us as followers of Christ have and we live with each day, which is why I'm excited to get to today's focus. So our focus from our passage today is living in the fullness of the Spirit. Now, to be fully committed to this, this is one of the hard ones, one of the harder parts of being rooted in Christ. And maybe for you, you're like, nope, Devin, I got this one on lock. That's great for me. It's been a difficult challenge. In fact, I actually remember when I was in grade 12, some of my earlier days of Christianity, And for those of you that don't know my testimony, I became a Christian in grade three through kids ministry, but then I fully surrendered my life to Christ when I was 18 and started to pursue what that looked like and started to look into what it meant to be rooted in Christ. So grade 12, early school year, I commit my life to Christ. I'm very excited. I'm very on fire. And I think I have it all figured out. I mean, who hasn't heard someone at 18 say they've got it all figured out? So the way I behaved, the way I acted in my life, I was like, you know what? I got this all figured out. On Tuesdays and Sundays, I'll be the Christian. And then on the other days, I'll just be the way I was before. 
And here was the kicker. Like in my brain, I was like, this is, this is how you do it. This is how you live out Christianity. And as I was getting closer to graduation, I was becoming more and more confident in that thought process. And you'll notice that I'm, I'm saying a lot of things like it's I or me, because I was believing that this was solely done out of my strength and my ability. So as I get closer to graduation, one of my good friends that I spent pretty much every day with, I was over at my friend's house. And we were just hanging out, playing video games. And my friend's parent comes into the room and just says to me, like, hey, so tell me about this Christian thing. Like, you became one just recently, and you want to go to Bible school. What's that like? And just kind of asking all those good questions. And I talked about how I felt set apart, or how I felt um, that Christ was really important in my life. And I felt this calling to a life in ministry. And the conversation was going well. And then the parent asked me, like, well, what's changed about you? How, how you've behaved, how you've acted, what's different? And again, me thinking that I had it all figured out, I puff out my chest and I give this long spiel, which for me, a long spiel is more than one sentence. But I, I give this long spiel about how like, you know, being, living a life for Christ is different than living in the world and talking about all these things. And I was like, and I am crushing it. And this whole time, my friend is beside me. This friend that has seen me every single day, this friend that knows how I act, how I behave, and this friend that remained silent through my entire speech. Then they spoke up. And I'll never forget what they said. My friend literally looked at me straight in the face and said, Devin, you're a liar. You haven't changed one bit. And that was the biggest piece of humble pie I've ever eaten. And by eaten, I mean shoved in my face. Because after that, you're completely deflated. You're like, oh, okay. So clearly I'm, and there's something more. But it was a good moment in my life because it reminded me that it's not in my own strength that I am transformed. It is in, through the work of the Holy Spirit inside of us and the work of what Jesus did on the cross. And on top of that, while I'm here at Southview, I've been working through this process of licensing, and one of the requirements is taking a class called Alliance History and Thought. And this idea of living in the Spirit is a part of the lectures that we are learning and studying. So I've been learning this as well as preparing for this message. So it's kind of exciting that we get to hop in. So thank you to our reader. I appreciate you reading our text for us. And if you hear those, like verse 18, you can tell that we're in the middle of a thought. And in fact, if you look at it in your Bible, you're kind of at the end of a thought because it breaks down in different headings. But Paul's been talking about Christian living and the significance of it. He references it as walking in wisdom. And if you flip back through Ephesians, you can see that he's saying, like, walk, walk, walk. He keeps bringing up that it's a walk. And the reason why he does that is because it's a daily thing that we do. As we walk with God, we abide in him, and then he abides in us. So while he's talking about this, you also notice another pattern. He says there's do's and there's don'ts. Paul's saying, you know, do this, don't do this. And he's calling out two different lifestyles. And in his comparisons, he says that one lifestyle is, is like the choice of light, and one lifestyle is like darkness. And Paul shares that how followers, as followers of Jesus, we are children of the light. So it's important that our lives reflect that of those who live in the light of Christ. Now, it's easy when we come to these kinds of passages to look at the do's and the don'ts and just be like, oh, another list, another objective, another thing that I have to do in order to be a Christian. But that's the farthest thing from the truth. We do play a part in the lifestyle that we choose, but it's the spirit in us that does all of the transforming. And Paul is talking about life with God and how it's better than life without God. How the Spirit offers us wisdom and helps guide us. 
So then when we get to verses 15 to 17, which I want to read for us, Paul says this, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. See, Paul's wrapping up his do's and don'ts, and he does it with a warning. He warns the reader to be wary of how they're living. Focusing on things of God is wise and looking for opportunities to live in that light or in a God-honoring lifestyle is important. And he uses strong words to, des- to describe the other one. He uses words like it's unwise to live a life outside of it. It's evil and foolish. Not words that you want to put on to the decisions that you're making in your life. But he's really just trying to get this point across And he expands on it in verse 18, teaching his audience that the only way to live in the fullness of the Spirit is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's look at what he says. Verse 18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Now, there's a lot to unpack even in those few short words and something that can help And this is something that can help root us in our life with Christ. But he has this comparison in there. He talks about drunkenness or being drunk. And he talks about being filled with the Spirit. Well, this passage isn't fully talking about drinking in a direct relation to being filled with the Spirit. He's using it instead as an example. See, he's using drunkenness to explain what life is like when you don't have the Spirit in you. See, when you get drunk, you lose control of your normal self. You, you become impaired. And Paul is comparing worldly living or the lifestyle that he's saying avoid as you giving control to that very lifestyle. You are allowing it to reign in your life. You're allowing it to rule you. Now, what Paul is stating is that that living to that standard of the world is giving power to it. And it's just like throwing that control away because it leads you to nothing. So then Paul says, instead, be filled with the Spirit. Instead of choosing worldliness and all the emptiness that it can have, choose to live by the Spirit, allowing the Spirit to take control and create change in your life. And that transformation makes you look different. See, back at the beginning of this series, which is all the way back in January, Sam kicked it off and he taught on John 15, which, which is where Jesus says that he is the vine and we are the branches. And if we remain in the vine, which is living fully in the spirit, then we will produce fruit that impacts both our lives and others around us. There's change that happens. And one of the pastors that I listen to on podcast is, uh, some, his name's Andy Stanley. He often looks at scripture differently than I do, or he gives different perspectives. So I quite enjoy listening to his sermons. But he has a quote that I wanted to share with us um, during this time together. And then when he talks about following Jesus, he often says this catchphrase. And if you've ever listened to his sermons, he, he loves his catchphrases. But it says, following Jesus will make your life better and will make you better at life. And he does this on purpose. It sticks out. So I just want to read it one more time. It says, following Jesus will make your life better and will make you better at life. See, when he uses this catchphrase, he's saying that going through life, the ups, the downs, the challenges that it has, we all know life has moments of chaos. He's saying that when you go through that life, it is better to go through it with God than it is to go through it without God. Paul in this passage is saying, who are you giving control to? The, word, the way of the world, which leads to a life of debauchery, nothingness, or are you giving control to the Spirit? 
who we can trust is faithful, who offers everything we need for righteousness right now and secures us eternal treasures in heaven. I mean, the options here, it's one way way better than the other. But for every Christian, we live in this tension every single day. We have to choose to live in the Spirit. Now, our denomination, the Alliance, they, as I've been learning in my class, they have this great term or theological term for it, which is called sanctification. Now, if you're here last week, Mark Peters did a great job of talking about that in his Yielded Life sermon. But for the last few weeks, sanctification has been a heavy part of what I have been learning in my class. So you simply put, sanctification is being set apart from the world and sin by God for God. And here's the best part. This whole thing is done by God. He intercedes on our behalf with the death of his son, Jesus, on the cross. He rises three days later, defeating death in sin, giving us the opportunity to be at one with God again. When we believe that as followers of God, we receive that as a gift. Our debt of sin is paid in full. Now here's the thing. In that moment of salvation, we are sanctified positionally. And this is something I've been learning over my time and being in the Alliance. So sanctified positionally, meaning we are declared righteous and holy because Christ's perfect obedience completely covers us. So at the moment of salvation, you are now made right. It is complete. It is full. But the outworking of sanctification in our thinking, in our behavior, and how we act is not fully done. We receive the Holy Spirit who will continue to sanctify us progressively day in and day out. Think of it like this. When you buy a house, you become a homeowner, and that home becomes a vessel that you live in. Now, when you first move into a house, it doesn't quite feel like home because you haven't made each room what you need for it. There might be, well, there's definitely unpacking to do, but there might be renovations and, or like just fresh paint or new flooring or whatever it is when you get to your house. But what you do is you go through room by room, making it your own, making it a place where you feel comfortable living in. It's the exact same when you are a Christian. The Holy Spirit comes into us and we are now the vessel that it lives in and it, and it works in our lives and it says like, oh, this lifestyle choice you haven't handed over yet? Could you give that to me? This area of your life that you're still kind of clinging to, would you surrender that? Will you make yourself available to be filled by the Spirit? Now, for some of us, that's a fast and easy process. And you hear those stories of people that come to Christ really quickly and they just see dramatic change from that moment forward. And for other of us, it's a, it's a slow burn. It takes time as we go. But when you give more control to the Holy Spirit, you realize that it's worth it, that it's beneficial, that it makes life better. This is what living in the fullness of the Spirit means. And this is a major theme throughout this entire letter. And as I was doing my studying, I was reading a commentary on this passage, and it was by an author named Klein Snodgrass. Now, I could not imagine going through school with that as your last name, but he's far smarter than I am. And he broke it down like this. And it'll show up here on the screens. In chapter 1, verse 23, Christ is the fullness of God. He's talking about Christ is the fullness of God. And then in chapter 3, verse 19, he says Christians are to know the love of Christ in order to be filled into all fullness of God. Then in chapter 4, verse 10, Christ ascended in order to fill all things. 
And then chapter 4, verse 13, Christians are to attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And I encourage you right now, take out your phones, snap a picture of this, and during your devotional time this week, read through Ephesians. Look at the references. See what he's getting at. But this shows a fuller picture of what it means to live in the fullness of the Spirit. And that is what verse 18 is trying to get us to. So then... How do we apply this today? How do we put this into our lives, put it into practice? Now, the easy answer, and I say it's easy because it's easier said than done, but the easy answer is we root ourselves in the fullness of the Spirit. Like Mark Peters said last week, we are sanctified. And a prayer that you could implement into your daily routine or into your weekly routine is this. You could simply say, every morning or every evening before you go to bed, God, show me through the Holy Spirit what I haven't given to you. Nice, simple, one sentence. And then after you finish that prayer, just sit in silence and wait. Now, sometimes something might come and other times maybe not, but it's committing to it. Day in, day out, allowing the Spirit to continue to work in you. The more we make ourselves available to God, the more we will be ready to be filled with the Spirit. And please remember, this is a journey. This isn't like a one and done stamped moment in your, in your life. It's called progressive sanctification, not instant. And this journey gives, of giving more of yourself to Christ, it takes time. And it's going to look different for each and every one of you. So don't compare yourself to your friends that are Christians that are growing at different rates. But it's a daily thing that we need to take part in. So let's keep being filled in the Spirit. It's something that happens again and again. And whether this is a brand new concept to you or it's something that you already do in your daily practice or something you did once and you're like, maybe I'll give it a shot again, continue to progress, continue to invite, continue to pray for the filling of the Spirit. Make yourself that vessel that is ready to receive it. But let's, along this journey, not forget to encourage each other. It's hard, and there's challenges, and there's tough things that you might get stuck on a sin and you have a hard time getting it out of your life, and it takes time. That's the joy of allowing the Spirit to work in you and the Spirit to transform you, is it's going to do that great work. So let's encourage each other. Let's be a support for each other, whether in small group, whether here on the weekends, whether in ministries that you're a part of. Let's talk about what God's doing in our lives. Because as Paul warns us, no matter what, whether you're a Christian or not, you are giving control to something, whether you're aware of it or not. So let's choose who we give that control to. And the Holy Spirit has a really good resume. So let's give it to him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the work you are doing in our lives. May we lean and live into the fullness of the Spirit that we have through salvation. May you continue to work in us, helping us live each day more and more rooted in you. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So now we get to come to our high point in our service, our time of communion. And as we live in the fullness of the Spirit, we get to take part in this spiritual practice. This bread represents Christ's body broken for us. And this cup represents his blood poured out for us. And we come to this table as a part of our spiritual practice, just as Jesus taught us. And we do this so we can remember, so we can receive Before we come to our time of communion, I wanted to give you guys a chance just to stop and to reflect. Maybe during this time, the Holy Spirit's been stirring something inside you saying, you need to give this to me. Or you need to hand control of this over. And maybe maybe not, but but you, it's good to take that time to just sit in that and reflect. So I'm going to give us just a couple minutes Have some time, think, pray, connect with God, 
And then I'll wrap us up with a word of prayer. God, we thank you for this time of communion. May this be a time of reflection, remembering the work that Jesus has done on the cross. And we thank you for this spiritual food that we are about to receive from this time of communion. Amen. So let's get your bread out if you haven't already. And this is his body broken for us. Let us take and receive together. Then take out your cup if you don't have it ready yet. And this is Christ's blood poured out for us, giving us forgiveness of sin. Let's take and receive together. So thank you for joining us today. And as we continue our time of worship out in the Cardo, I encourage you, grab a coffee, say hi to someone new, grab a friend, sit down, have that time together. But before we head on out, would you stand for a closing word benediction? I want to read Romans 12 verses 1 to 2, which is a scripture that points to sanctification, and it just puts it so beautifully. So Romans 12 verse 1 to 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. May this be your truth and encouragement this week. Have a good one. Go in peace.